Hey guys, I'm coming to you this week from Seattle where I just attended Pass Summit. If you've never been, it's awesome. I highly recommend it. It's good training. You meet a lot of fun people and for you know all of you who stopped me and said hi in the hallways and in sessions, you know, thank you. I loved meeting you. Uh, it was really great. Next Tuesday, November 14th, I'm gonna be speaking at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific at the Pass Security Virtual Chapter about SQL injection. And so this week I kind of wanted to give you a little bit of a precursor or a taste of what that's gonna be like. Specifically, I wanna talk about four misconceptions that I know a lot of people have about SQL injection, about how it may not affect them. And so I wanna clear those up right off the bat. The first thing I've heard a lot is that, you know, my database information isn't public, I don't need to worry about SQL injection. All right, let's try a magic trick. Mm, do you have tables called user or product or inventory sales? Even if it weren't one of those table names, you probably have tables that are pretty easy to guess, making it easy for someone you know, with nefarious intentions to hack into your server, to perform SQL injection based on table names that are just kind of generic sounding that you probably have in your database. So the fact that you don't disclose your table names publicly doesn't mean that people can't guess them, right? It's probably pretty easy to guess some of the table names in your database. Misconception number two. A lot of people say that they obfuscate their table names. So, you know, I'm, I'm okay, I'm protected. No one's gonna be able to perform SQL injection attacks against me. Well, if you've never heard of security through obscurity, I recommend you looking that up, but basically it's a bad idea. Even if you have the most convoluted table names, um, you know, whatever, AZ2538, because you want job security and you're gonna name everything super crazy so no one else can take over your job. I really hope you don't do that. But even let's say it's they're, they're not the typical business names um, that you would see in a database, people can still figure out the table names, right? I mean, you got sys.objects uh, in SQL Server and a bunch of other DMVs and things that can be queried that will tell you the names of tables and columns and you know users and roles in your database. So it doesn't really matter what you call them, it's really easy to query that stuff. Additionally, a lot of that stuff might get leaked out through error messages, right? If there's a if you have a web app and there's like a 500 internal server error and it's doing like a stack uh, trace dump onto the screen for a user, uh, they might see a table name in there. Now, hopefully that those features are turned off. You should never be revealing those things proactively, but that's not to say that it doesn't happen by accident or that a developer, you know, accidentally flag that debugging option on and, you know, people are able to discover those names just through your application itself. Misconception number three. The developer's responsibility. You know, a lot of people like to play the blame game and say, oh, you know, no, that's the developer's job, or no, that's the that's the DBA's job. The thing with security, though, is that it's everybody's job to practice good security. So while yes, developers should be validating fields and sanitizing inputs and using parameters instead of dynamically building strings when they can, that's not to say that there's nothing for a DBA on the SQL Server side to do too. You can be doing those same kinds of validations, you could be locking down service accounts that are actually executing these queries, you could be escaping you know, special characters, all of the, the good things that you can do with SQL injection prevention, you should be doing. Don't just leave it to someone else. Misconception number four is just, I'm not a big enough fish for hackers to care about me or my company. You know, and that's completely illogical, right? And for this, this reason alone, there's a limited number of IP addresses out there, um, especially IPv4, right? And it makes it really easy to programmatically you know, run through all of them. And there's plenty of tools out there that automate SQL injection attempts, right? So it's not like anyone needs to be manually going somewhere to try to manually uh, SQL inject into your website. They're just clicking a button to do it. So worst case, you've got these 13 year olds who have watched someone use this tool on YouTube just randomly, you know, trying to get into websites for fun, you know, to vandalize them or whatever. Um, and at worst, you have people who are targeting the details of your your you know your niche business that maybe only has a few hundred or thousand customers and they're doing it because it's easy i mean data is easy to sell it's easy to retrieve it's not like this is like a hard skill you know that it takes to actually perform sql injection at least at the basic levels right so if you're not doing anything to protect against it these automated tools are going to have no problem getting in when it comes to personal personal data even if you only have a few hundred customers even leaking one customer's worth of data right is too much how would you feel right if your personal data got leaked and some company told you oh no it's okay it was only you and a couple others that we leaked right you're still not going to feel good about it 
you really need to protect every single person's uh, details that you do keep. So thanks for watching this week. If this video got your gears turning and you want to learn more about SQL injection, be sure to check, check out my talk next week. Um, on Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern at the uh, PASS Security Virtual Chapter. I'll link to that below in the description. If you haven't already, please like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you guys again next week. Thanks.